Hello and welcome to this edition of Arlington Public News. I'm Paul Whirlin. And I'm Erin Dixon. At Arlington Public News, we bring you stories of interest to Arlington and surrounding communities. In tonight's newscast, we bring you highlights from the recent school committee meeting that addressed the dramatic impending rise in school enrollment. We talk to an expert about how to deal with tragic losses in our lives. And we bring you images from the total lunar eclipse as seen from Robbins Farm Park. Plus, we introduce you to Arlington's new animal control officer. That and more coming up next. Please stay with us. Arlington schools are at capacity, with even more students expected in the next several years. That's according to a report from demographers hired by Arlington Public Schools. The school committee held a meeting to talk about how to deal with the overcrowding September 24th at Town Hall. APN was there and has a look at the building options and opinions that were represented. I'm Brenta Mahoney for Arlington Public News at the school committee meeting focusing on enrollment. All of the town's varying committees, town meeting members and the public are getting a chance to speak about what to do about the schools that are now at capacity. The McKibben demographic research firm went through the population data for the school system and concluded enrollments are growing fast. And although they may level off after several years, something needs to be done now. An outcome of the forecast is we have a wave. We have a wave going through the system. And what's happening is uh, your elementaries are growing first and the, that cohort of children are going to move into your middle school and then move into your high school. The wave will continue, home sales will continue to happen, new people will come in, and so, so it's just that to keep that in mind, because I know a lot, a lot of folks would look back to this and say, oh, well, you know, it all, it all levels off there at the elementary schools. We're, we're going to be in good shape. In truth, 10 years from now, the elementary schools will be higher than they are today. Experts from HMFH Architects came up with several different options to address the school crowding. All call for a mix of temporary additions and other solutions at the Brackett, Hardy and Thompson Elementary Schools, as well as the Audison Middle School. School officials would also take back the privately used but town-owned Gibbs School for either kindergartners, fifth graders or sixth graders, or a combination of the latter two. If the Gibbs is not used, officials would go with long-term stacked modulars at the middle school. Variables include sending 8th graders to the high school. What this next diagram shows is we have to make a decision. What's the first decision you made? Let's say you've made the decision to put permanent traditional construction at Hardy and Thompson. So that's something we need to be thinking about in the near term, and that decision gets made. As you can see, that starts to preclude other things from happening. If you're starting to follow the thinking here, it's, you know, it's the puzzle of when you make one decision, it will impact how these other decisions are made. We looked at it, we're, you know, we're, we're happy to continue looking at any of these and, you know, other sort of variables because I think, you know, more heads in the room, somebody's going to come up with some other scenario that we haven't thought of. And that's, that's just, the way it should be. Despite the solutions, some are still asking how the school system that just went through rebuilding most of its elementary schools got to this point. But one thing that keeps sticking out to me and I feel like I'm kind of getting punched in the gut every time I hear it is Thompson. And I hopefully think that, um, I hope that moving forward we certainly take into account, uh, do a little bit better job planning for enrollment in our, in the feasibility process because for a school that was just built, that is far, you know, that's not right. Um, and, and I don't mean to point fingers at anyone, and I know quite a bit of work went into that, but it, uh, it certainly doesn't uh, sit well with me. Others taking issue with displacing the Arlington Center for the Arts, which has been running a children's visual and performing arts program out of the Gibbs for over 25 years. The Gibbs building has been home to the Arlington Center for the Arts the Leslie Ellis School, the Learn to Grow Preschool, and the Kelleher Center for Adults with Disabilities. The Gibbs organizations are not merely tenants. Over the course of nearly 30 years, we have become part of the fabric of this town. And the Arlington Center for the Arts is not just about kids. ACA is also part of what makes Arlington an attractive place to live. Shakespeare in the Park, Arlington Open Studios, free community theater, gallery exhibits, a vibrant and active artist studio community. These classes, camps, programs for adults and kids, these are the very kinds of things that are attracting people to our town. Some residents who spoke are wondering if these quick solutions are actually shortchanging students. 
I, I, do, I sort of don't like, at the end of the day, that you wind up with a 100-year-old building with the Gibbs. It was built in 1928. So you wind up with a 100-year-old building that I'm going to buy a house in this town to send my kids to a 100-year-old building. School committee will now consider all the various options, and at the next school committee meeting, people who are tenants at the Gibbs School will have a chance to say why they should stay there. Brenda Mahoney for Arlington Public News. Arlington School Superintendent Dr. Kathleen Bodie tells APN the town will form a budgetary task force to figure out what options make the most financial sense. There likely wouldn't be any funding from the state as the high school is already on track for that. This is the second time AHS is going before the Massachusetts School Board Authority. The proposal for an updated school did not make the cut last year. Dr. Bodie says this time it has made the MSBA's shortlist for a closer look and they will know if the proposal is accepted by December. Several recent untimely deaths in Arlington have hit our community particularly hard. To try to understand how to deal with loss and trauma in our lives and those of our children, we turn to an expert at the Children's Room, an invaluable resource in Arlington for grieving families and children. Much as we wish they wouldn't, bad things happen in our lives. Um, for that reason, we are here at the Children's Room to talk to Deborah Rivlin, Education Director at the Children's Room, about how to deal with those situations uh, when bad things happen, how to talk about them, how to process, and how to behave. We don't protect by not giving information to children because it's not a matter, are they going to hear it? The question really is, who, to, who do you want them to hear it from? And we say the trusted adults in their lives, their parents, their teachers, people in their lives, so that we can clear up misconceptions and misinformation. And so it is beginning with the simplest basic truth. Doesn't mean you give every detail. It's based on development, developmentally, where a child is and how much information you would give. But so the way I like to say it is, you don't have to tell everything, but you don't want to change the story. You don't want to you know, say, oh, it was an accident when, in fact, if it wasn't, and you have to go back, because we want to build a solid foundation of trust. You know, I often say that whatever the age, whether we're three or 103, if we have a gap in information of what happened, we want to know we fill it in. Right, we're going to fill and it we in And we don't want, ourselves. yeah, and, and young children to fill it in um, with their imagination, which is usually much worse than reality. Not just young children, all of us, you know, when we have to fill, it, fill that in. Um, children till about the age of five or six don't really understand permanence, so it's not unusual for them, you know, to, it makes total sense to say, I know they died and they're not coming back, but um, they would never miss my birthday, you know, that's sort of right. uh, together. I think it's um, very important that we use the, the words like, um, not euphemisms, like lost, you know, so if you say to a young child, we lost Uncle David, you know, what does that mean to them? Right, you know? right. Um, They're thinking very yeah, literally. And literally, like, can we go and find, find him, him? Or why is everybody crying and not looking for him? So we want to be able to use words like die and death and, we, and having a definition of what does it mean, you know. Certainly with very, you know, with, with young children and keeping it simple, knowing that children, young children, are going to ask the same questions over and over and over and over again. It's not that they're not hearing you. They're trying to gain mastery over what does this mean. Um, because they don't understand permanence, the very young ones, they will, you know, be looking. They may not, sometimes parents go, why, they don't seem sad enough. Um, but I think kids being included instead of excluded really helps children. Sometimes they appear cold and crass, but what I want to say to all parents and teachers working with this age, don't think of them that that's, you know, that's what they're feeling inside. So I go, sometimes I say about this age, they're like, you know, the duck on the lake that appears one way, but what's happening under the water, their feet are going, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so we have to really be careful about um, not judging and um, being open. For Arlington Public News and here at the Children's Room with Deborah Rivlin, this is James Milan. Thanks for joining us. You know, Erin, we're really fortunate to have such a valuable resource like the Children's Room right here in Arlington for children and their families as well. Absolutely. 
And you can watch the extended interview with the Children's Room on the web at news.acmi.tv. We want to alert parents of young children that our next story is of a mature nature. According to a survey released by the Association of American Universities, one in four women experienced sexual assault or sexual misconduct during their college years. We asked our APN college interns to look at how this issue has affected them, their schoolmates, and their schools. Sexual assault has been an issue on college campuses throughout America for decades now. It wasn't until recently when the Association of American Universities sent out a report on sexual assault and misconduct on college campuses that showed the severity of the problem. The survey, which polled at 27 different schools, showed that one third of senior females reported being a victim or non-consensual sexual contact at least once, and those identifying as gay, transgender, queer, or non-conforming reported, reported nearly 40%. We took a look at three different Boston schools, Emerson College, Brandeis University, and Boston University, to see how Massachusetts compared. The study shows that individuals who identify as transgender, queer, non-conforming, or questioning have the highest rate of sexual assault. Followed by females, white males have the lowest rate. Emerson College has been named most LGBTQ friendly school by Princeton Review two years in a row. However, the school is still struggling with the issue of sexual assault within the LGBTQ community. I had a friend who was sexually assaulted here at Emerson. The atmosphere that was there wasn't super conducive to feeling comfortable and feeling like you were in a safe space to tell what happened. I saw her having to recount the story like again and again and again and it ultimately ended with her leaving the school because she felt like it wasn't a safe place for her. In May of last year, Emerson College created the Violence Prevention and Response Office. The office works to be a comfortable place for students to report any incidences as well as provides education to other Emersonians as to what consent is, how to be an active bystander, and how to say no. Students at Brenda show their surprises on the striking number of sexual assault cases provided by the AAU. However, in terms of a university climate and cases happen specifically on campus, Brandeis students appear less knowledgeable. Well, I guess it's surprising that's a lot of people. I'd want to know how they define sexual assault, I guess. I'm like so surprised about it. I like, think about it, but I don't think the situation is that serious. So such percentage is really high. However, sexual assaults do remain as a problem at Brandeis. According to the Brandeis Hood, Brandeis University Community Newspaper, five cases of sexual harassment were reported in two consecutive months last year. One of the student organizations of Brandeis, BSASSOE, Brandeis Students Against Sexual Violence, launched a petition supported by over 2,500 students in 2014 in order to urge the administration to raise awareness about sexual assaults and to better protect the survivors. As the students requested on the petition, now the Campus Rape Crisis Center is set up, resources guide become available to students, and the Speak Out Brandeis block is initiated for survivors to share stories. More than half the students surveyed by the AAU said that it is very or extremely likely that the individual's safety would be protected. Here at BU, while students admitted to having heard of incidents, they claim to feel safe at school. But should students really have such confidence in their universities? In April, Boston University's independent student newspaper, The Daily Free Press, published an article titled, How BU Fails Sexual Assault Victims. The article was written by an anonymous BU student. It details not the violence and emotional trauma that occurred when she was sexually assaulted, but how BU's administration handled her case after she reported it. She praises BU for finding her assailant responsible for rape and initially suspending him for a semester. In April, she received an email describing BU's final decision to not punish her assailant, outside of some gentle scolding. The AAU survey found wide variation across the 27 institutions surveyed, with no clear explanation why. Regardless, this survey shines light on an issue that is prevalent on every college campus. There are many available resources to help prevent or provide support after regrettable situations. 24-hour hotlines and organizations are eager to help. To keep up with more news on this topic, be sure to check out our weekly blog, Eager for Consent. For Arlington Public News and ACMI, I'm Koala Shit.
I'm Gabriella Kula. And I'm Erica Matera Banoon. You know, Paul, it is a serious issue, but as a college student myself, I'm glad it's something that people are addressing. Yes, absolutely. And we want to thank our interns for bringing the story to us from their own college campuses. Our next story is most certainly kid friendly, we're happy to say. Katie Kozakowski, Arlington's new animal control officer, introduces herself to the community and talks about her past experience, what she enjoys about her job, and how it is to work with her trusty companion, Winnie. We are here on this beautiful fall morning with Arlington's relatively new animal control officer, Katie Kozakowski. Katie, thanks for talking with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And welcome, <laughs> welcome to Arlington. Thank you very much. Um, so why don't you just tell us a little bit about what your previous experience has been um, and how it is that you came to be our current con animal control officer. Sure. Um, well, I actually, before this, I worked at the MSPCA Nevins Farm for about almost five years. Um, before that, I went to UMass Amherst for animal science and criminal justice. Um, and I worked at animal hospitals while I was going to school there too. So, and I worked at the MSPCA, like I said, for almost about five years now and that I helped out with law enforcement cases and stuff and I thought they were really fun and I really always wanted to try doing animal control. So when I heard that there was an opening here, I kind of jumped at it as quickly as I could. And I just realized that I'm being a very rude host in terms of not <laughs> having introduced our other guest. So this is Winnie. This is my rescue dog. I've had her for about three and a half, four months now. Um, she came from the MSPCA in Nevins Farm and she was found in Brockton as a stray. So she was really scared when she was at the animal control office in Brockton and I loved working with a little scared dog. But she loves to walk around the parks. She loves to meet new people. She gets really excited when she meets new people and other dogs too. And instead of keeping her in her crate at home, I'd rather have her out and about with me. So I try and bring her as much as I can. So what does a typical day, I know you've only been, you've been doing the job for a couple of months now? Yeah, since the beginning of August is when I started. Um, typical day, I would say, is usually what I do. I'll come in, obviously, check over all my voicemails, anything, see if I need to call any ba anybody back from the night before, and then drive around town, kind of go to the different parks that are in the area to make sure everybody's nice and happy, there's not any issues, um, everybody's on leash where they're supposed to be and when they're supposed to be, too. And then from there, I have a phone that I carry around with me, so anybody who calls Animal Control, it'll go directly to me. Um, I will pick up as soon as I possibly can or call you back as soon as I possibly can and take kind of the calls as they go. How much a part of your day is responding to calls versus just being out out and about and kind of checking on things? Well with the calls a lot of them are a lot of wildlife calls so it's pretty much just me answering questions over the phone. Occasionally you'll, I'll get like a stray dog or there's an injured wildlife somewhere or an injured cat somewhere too or something's been hit by a car. That doesn't seem to happen too too much. It's more just there's an animal out in the daytime and I don't think it should be out in the daytime. What do I do kind of thing. So it's more it's a lot of educating people and letting them know that these things are okay or these things are not okay and when I should step in too. What's a really fun part of your job as far as you're concerned? Uh, I would say fun part is meeting everybody. I really like going out there. Everybody is super, super welcoming. So they're like, I don't think I've met one person that was scared of me or didn't want to meet me or anything like that. Usually people will go out of their way, pull over off the side of the road if they see me walking around looking for something, be like, oh, how can I help you? I'm so-and-so. It's really nice to meet you. Um, and I really like meeting other people's animals too. Like just walking up, knowing who the dogs are, I feel like is really important too. That way, the more people I meet, the more animals I meet. If a dog ends up being loose or the owner can't find them for whatever reason, I might be able to place them with their owner a little bit easier too. I'm willing to talk to anybody and everybody, so if anybody ever has any questions or just wants to stop by and say hi, um, I'd really appreciate it and I'd love to do that too. For Arlington Public News, here with Arlington's Animal Control Officer, Katie Kozakowski, and of course, Winnie, this is James Milan signing off. Thanks for joining us. Last week, two APN interns were delayed for hours while taking public transportation. Being intrepid reporters, they made the best use of the delay to file this report. Last Thursday, the red line again experiences more than an hour of delays. There seem to be problems all the way down the red line due to issues in Alewife and multiple trains going out of service. This again calls into question the financial future of the MBTA. The Financial Control Board's first meeting took place last Tuesday, the 22nd, where they spoke about many of the MBTA's problems, including the efficiency. The board was created by Governor Charlie Baker after the multitude of breakdowns on the T last winter. 
The board's first report shows that the T's operation and debt services are growing at a faster rate than MBTA's revenue can keep up with. Unless this problem is dealt with immediately, the board warned that the system will face $272 million of structural deficit within the next year. For Arlington Public News, I'm Gabriella Kula. Did you happen to see the lunar eclipse on the night of September 27th? Well, if you missed it, here are some memorable images from Robbins Farm Park. It seemed like the whole of Arlington was at Robbins Farm Park on Sunday night, September 27th. That was the first time since 1982 that we could see a totally eclipsed supermoon, otherwise known as a blood moon. This phenomenon occurs when the sun, earth, and moon form a straight line. The sun's light casts earth's shadow onto the moon and prevents any direct sunlight from hitting the moon. On September 27th, citizens witnessed a total lunar eclipse, which occurs when the earth's darkest shadow, called the umbra, covers the moon. This is different from a partial lunar eclipse, where the moon is covered only by the Earth's penumbra, the outer part of the shadow. The moon appears red to us because the moon is only lit by sunlight refracted off of the Earth's atmosphere. This sunlight hits dust particles and clouds in the Earth's atmosphere, giving the moon a red tint. This blood moon was extra special because the total eclipse occurred in conjunction with a supermoon. We see a supermoon whenever the moon is at the closest point in its orbit to Earth. At this time, the moon appears brighter and larger than usual. The next time we will see a totally eclipsed supermoon is predicted to be in 2033. So until then, I'm Gayatri Sundarajan for Arlington Public News. You know, I'm, I'm aging myself, but uh, I was around 30 years ago, but I don't remember the last one, the, the last uh, supermoon eclipse, but I did see this one, which was really spectacular. It was. I was also not around for the last one, but I did get to take some time out of my work to watch this one, and it was a phenomenal sight to see. The Arlington High School football team is off to a good start with new coach Ryan Grendon. After a heart-wrenching one-point loss at Stoneham, the Ponders celebrated their return to the friendly confines of Pierce Field with a resounding win over Belmont High. As always, ACMI provided live coverage of the victory, and what a game it was. Hi everyone, I'm Phil Arcaro here with your AHS Sports Roundup. On Friday, the football team defeated Belmont by the score of 42-14. Now, let's go to the highlights, shall we? Let's start with the first quarter. First down and 20 for the Ponders. As Cohen would take the snap and get it over to Conroy. Alex Conroy would run it in for the score. Touchdown, Ponders. That would make it 7 to nothing, Arlington. Now, let's go to Belmont's turn this time. Second down to 10 for the Marauders. Christopher would look to throw and a screen pass to Mackay Johnson. And Johnson would score as the Marauders would get their first touchdown of the game. 21 to 7 as they would trail. Now let's go to the kickoff as Bel Belmont would kick it off and number 25 would run it all the way down and he would go the distance for the score 28 to 7 in favor of the Ponders. A couple plays later the Marauders would make it second down and 7 as Christopher would look to throw it. And number four for the Ponders would score a 25-yard pick six for the score. Touchdown, Marauders. Make it 35-7 to seven as the Ponders would get yet another touchdown. Ponders up once again, 35-7 to seven on second down and 13 from about the 34. As he would look to throw it. At, to number 21, he would go down. No, he wouldn't. And he would go all the way for the score. Touchdown, Ponders, 42-7. to seven, As Arlington will lead it 42-7. to seven, And that will be all she wrote. The final score from Pierce Field, Arlington 42, Belmont 14. Now let's go to some highlights and some interviews with Scott Zwick. Tell us a little bit about... The transition sure. from the tough loss last week to coming out here and executing. Yeah, last week was tough. Uh, a lot of uh, adversity, a lot of emotions that went with that. And we looked at the film and we decided, man, even though we didn't have the outcome we wanted, a lot of things went right. You know, uh, we were proud of a lot of the effort that our kids showed, the resiliency. Uh, we went down with 50 seconds left and no one on our team believed we were going to lose that game. 42-14, to 14, that would be your final score as the Marauders 
would be defeated by the Spy Ponders of Arlington. I'm Phil Arcaro for AHS Sports Roundup. Back to you guys in the studio. And last but not least, we bring you highlights from this year's Town Day festivities. I'm Brenda Mahoney for Arlington Public News. From police and fire displays to booths and information and food and entertainment, Town Day is really about community. From kids and pony rides to politicians and cheerleaders, Town Day 2015 was another great day for residents to get to know Arlington. We do this every year. It's really fun. We like to see all the people out here, see what's out there. Booths lined on Massachusetts Avenue work to entertain and inform. So we have a technology initiative, which has been our, we just finished year three. Um, for year three alone, we raised over $100,000, which is amazing. All that money goes directly back into the school, help to fund digital arts at the high school, um, computer science and programming at the middle school, a whole bunch of different activities. Emergency services showed off their capabilities and reminded folks that they are a friendly service here for them. Smoke detectors are huge. Make sure um, you change the batteries twice a year. Um, come in the stations whenever, you know, if you're walking by, say hi. You know, we're always welcome. There's always someone in there to say hi. From cool tunes and good food, Town Day inspired and captured that sense of community in all. We love to come out to Town Day and see what's new and uh, say hello to our neighbors and help participating all of the local businesses. Do you come every year? We do and uh, what we like to do in our neighborhood is after Town Day we have a block party and it's a lot of fun. The community gets together and it just it's a whole day of Arlington fun. Brenda Mahoney, Arlington Public News. Thank you for joining us this week to explore local events and issues around Arlington. Check out extended interviews and our latest segments on the web at news.acmi.tv. And don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Arlington Public. Please join us next time for another edition of Arlington Public News. I'm Paul Whelan. And I'm Erin Dixon. See you next time. <laughs>